Welcome to Imagine Otherwise, the podcast about the people and projects bridging art, activism, and academia to build better worlds. Episodes offer in-depth interviews with creators who use culture for social justice and explore the nitty-gritty work of imagining otherwise. I'm your host, Kathy Hanneback. Welcome to the Imagine Otherwise podcast, which is produced by Ideas on Fire, an academic editing and consulting agency helping progressive, interdisciplinary scholars write awesome texts, enliven public conversations, and create more just worlds. This week's episode is brought to you by our Grad School Rockstar Program and Dissertation Rockstar Bootcamp. Enrollment for both are now open for spring 2017. Both of these programs help progressive, interdisciplinary scholars, like those featured on this podcast, create awesome work, build accountability and community for their projects, and rock their interdisciplinary careers. If you or someone you know is a grad student who wants to create a regular writing routine, stop drowning in email, don't we all, prioritize self-care, and actually finish their dissertation alongside other social justice-oriented scholars, you can go to ideasonfire.net to find out more. This is episode 26, and my guests today are Mimi Cook and Lawrence Min Bui Davis. Mimi is a queer Vietnamese American scholar, teacher, and writer, as well as a visiting assistant professor in Asian American Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. Her research and writing interests span Vietnam War memory, race and religion, mental health, queer of color feminist critique, Asian American motherhood, and second generation Asian American life. Her writings have appeared in Black Girl Dangerous, Briar Patch Magazine, and Power Lines. Lawrence is the founding director and co-editor-in-chief of the Asian American Literary Review. He's also the curator of Asian Pacific American Studies for the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. Since 2005, he has taught Asian American literature, Asian American film, and mixed race studies for the Asian American Studies program at the University of Maryland. His fiction, poetry, and creative nonfiction have appeared in Plowshares, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, Gastronomica, Kenyan Review, AG&I, and Fiction International. In this interview, I talk with Mimi and Lawrence about how academia can better address parenting, mental health, and wellness, as well as their new special issue of the Asian American Literary Review called Open in Emergency a special issue on Asian American mental health, which is coming out in January 2017. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So you two are the editors of a fantastic forthcoming special issue of the Asian American Literary Review called Open in Emergency. I'd love to hear a little bit about how that special issue came about and the topics that it addresses. Um, thank you. So the special issue is about mental health, and we can talk a little bit more later about the elements of it. Um, but I'll talk a little bit now about how the project came to be and, and how I started thinking about mental health. So I'm actually a survivor of postpartum depression um, about four years ago. And when I was going through postpartum depression, I was trying to think about what made life so hard at that time and what made it so hard to talk about what I was going through and to get support and even to know what support looked like. I was struggling with motherhood, but I was also um, in grad school dissertating at the time and trying to figure out my academic career. Um, And I'm also Asian American, I identify as Vietnamese American. So I started thinking about how my mental health needed to be understood in the context of all of those things, in the context of how, how hard motherhood is, my struggle with my kind of career and what it means to be an academic and a mother and Asian American. And so mental health for me became less about um, kind of my individual experience and more about the context of social forces, of history, of structural violence that I was facing. And so that's where the, the questions kind of first started for me. Um, I started teaching a class, I, I teach at the University of Maryland, College Park, And I created a class on the second generation, meaning children of immigrants and their experiences. Uh, I myself identify as second generation Asian American, Vietnamese American. Uh, My parents came here, uh, much of my family came here as refugees after the Vietnam War. And so when I designed this class, I start the class with suicide because of the mental health crisis in the Asian American community. The, there are some real you know, disturbing statistics around high levels of suicidal ideation among Asian Americans, especially college age, especially women. And so I 
decided that if I was going to teach a class about second generation Asian Americans, I needed to highlight those kinds of mental health struggles. And then as I taught the class, I saw how much that resonated with my students, the kinds of conversations that it was able to open up by starting a class on suicide and mental health issues. And so for me, that started extending the question to thinking about uh, mental health in Asian America more broadly. What is it? What does that look like in Asian American life? What does wellness and unwellness look like for Asian Americans specifically? At around that point, we started having conversations about doing a project. We weren't sure what it would look like. Uh, AALR, Asian American Literary Review, had done a number of special issues in the past. And so we thought, okay, what if we geared a project and a, a a teaching program. One of the things that we've done with some past special issues is unroll the issue and ask uh, a number of folks at different colleges and universities, and in some cases high schools, to consider teaching it at the same time where we could sync them up and try and create a larger national conversation about a particular topic. So in the past we did one on the 10th anniversary of September 11th and one on mixed race, one on the 40th anniversary of the fall of Saigon last year. So we started planning a mental health special issue back in 2013. And so one of the ways it came into being was through a series of dreaming sessions at the AAAS, the Association for Asian American Studies Conference. We held introductory one, just like we wanna, we, we recognize that there's a mental health crisis in Asian American communities. How would we go about dealing with it? What are the kind of, what's the shape? What are the contours of this crisis? How do we understand it? What would next steps be? and then built each year through a series of conversations with what a special issue might look like and, and how we might deploy it and what our goals for it might be. One of the things that's so exciting about this special issue is that it's not your traditional special issue of an academic journal, right? It's fantastically interdisciplinary and multimedia. You have pamphlets, letters, a really exciting tarot deck, um, poetry, visual art, all these different kinds of, of culture that aren't usually found in special issues of academic journals. Why did you decide to go that multimedia route? And what was that process like? When we were thinking about how to approach mental health, um, both Lawrence and I come from arts and humanities backgrounds. And what we didn't want to do was come to it from a resource approach, meaning like how to make professional counseling and psychological help more accessible or even culturally competent, like how to get resources to people, which I think is a very common way of approaching mental health issues, especially for minority communities. Like how do we make it culturally competent for them? Which I think is an important question, but we wanted to ask what the arts and humanities could provide in um, expanding how to think of mental health. What, what kind of new ways can we understand mental health and mental unwellness if we approach it from the humanities, but also um, if we start with Asian American life itself and ask the questions from there. So that's part of why um, ALR was a great fit in, in doing this kind of project. And I'll let Lawrence talk a little more about that. So we're, so we're a literary journal, and we do work frequently with academics, and a lot of our stuff is taught in the classroom, and so we're constantly trying to think about pedagogy. But we're kind of ex trying to expand form from a starting place of a literary journal or from the book and thinking about it almost as book art, and then looping in academia or asking academic scholars and teachers to stretch their practices and stretch how they approach particular disciplinary subjects. For, for this... We wanted very much to, as Mimi was saying, to think of it as an intervention into a kind of set, or set of standardized and calcified approaches to mental health, and in some cases, approaches that are not, not only not dealing with the crisis, but are actually part of the crisis, are kind of replicating some of these structures of violence. So form for us became a way of kind of breaking out of those, in, in some cases by deconstructing. So, so we have within the special issue, a mock DSM that's meant to be a DSM with all the pages torn out and reapproached. We have a, a pamphlet on postpartum depression that's a treated pamphlet where we actually start with an actual pamphlet and then think about what are its gaps, where does it need to be redacted, what needs to be added, how can we make visible what is left, unvis left invisible in this pamphlet, opening up opportunities that a kind of traditional academic prose or traditional literary prose or poetry might not be able to engage. So our tarot project, I think, is a, is a way of starting with what Asian American life looks like in some sense. Um, we, we have a friend and colleague, uh, Long Bui, who, besides being a wonderful scholar, it also does tarot readings. And we were um, at a conference with him a couple of years ago, and he did a tarot reading for us. And we got to thinking about tarot as a form and 
the prevalence of fortune telling practices in Asian American communities and how much those practices have to tell us about unwellness and wellness um, and how the project for us, we wanted the larger project to be able to amplify existing wellness practices and name them as wellness practices and think of not so much to, you know, be careful, being careful about romanticizing them, but think about what productive possibilities they offer us. And so it made sense for us to take tarot as a form and then adapt it and play with it and make use of it. One of the artists and scholars that, that has been working on the special issue with you, Mimi Nguyen, was actually on the last episode of um, this podcast. And she was talking about how tarot, we, were, we had a great conversation about tarot and why so many social justice communities of a variety of sorts have turned to tarot and kind of what what that does and how they transform it and remake it and, and kind of make it their own. And it seems... It, it seems like there's a, a lot of good connections here about kind of tarot being a kind of open form that you can do a lot of different things with, and it's adaptable to different communities and different questions and, and different kind of social justice projects. Yeah, and I think I think for us, it's interpretive possibilities, that it's a practice, that it's, you know, not only just a kind of visual form that we could use, and then for the, for the deck of cards that we've created, we've asked a number of scholars and writers to and we'll t we can talk a little bit more about this to to kind of craft out these like replacing the traditional major arcana with figures that that we see as important to Asian American life and to use those to kind of trace out the invisible forces that are shaping our lives both you know kind of structural forces in many cases that are shaping our lives and shaping what counts as wellness and unwellness but always leaving open that when we receive the cards, it, it's not a kind of closed loop or end of a reading, but the starting point um, for, an, for an interpretive practice that hopefully we're engaging and developing together. So my academic background is actually in religious studies. Um, I got my PhD in religious studies, looking at Asian American religious life. And so when I encountered the tarot through our colleague and friend, Longboy, at a AAAS conference, um, that was a kind of interesting for me, almost ethnographical moment, like to look at this practice as a religious practice, as a meaning making practice, um, but in the hands of Asian Americans trying to make sense of their life, but coming out of the tarot, the original tarot deck, right, out of this kind of um, European history. And so, as Lauren said, we, we decided to rewrite the deck by renaming the figures. The figures, are, the cards are supposed to represent certain kinds of forces in, in our lives. And so we said, if we start with Asian American life. What are the forces we would want to identify and be able to make meaning of in our own lives if we are using these cards as really a, a religious practice? And you know, Asian Americans as religious people have always made meaning of their lives through their religious practices and navigating the structures of violence in their lives, right? Making sense of things like migration, displacement, racism, um, and so we thought the tarot was a great place to to kind of actively do that, to, to, to grapple with those issues, but also creating something that people could actually use and practice with. So some of the cards, for instance, are like the model minority, the refugee, the deportee. The survivor. And it's part of a, you know, for me, you know, thinking about force and telling practices in our communities. I also come from a Vietnamese family for whom ghost practices is really common and like qigong and healing practices are common and so some of this is a way of or raising questions about ways of knowing and knowledge systems and what counts and and so for our communities i think about you know across the expanse of asian american literature but also across my family experiences and experiences i know of in my communities thinking about how ghosts um, or other sort of non-rational forces guide our lives or offer us care or wisdom becomes a, a kind of madness or an easy reading in an American context or a Western context as madness and become delegitimized. And so some of our project wants to look at that work and that um, violence that presses down our communities that tells them that certain ways of knowing are, are illegitimate, um, but also to, to try and restore them as wellness practices and as meaning making practices and to look to them for how they have in the past and how they do now and how they can in the future give us new ways of understanding our condition and point us in kind of healthier directions potentially. But it's also a marriage with Asian American studies uh, as, as a field too in, in academic work. So Mimi actually, other Mimi, I call her other Mimi. Other Mimi is a great example. You know, she, for the tarot 
deck for us wrote the text for the refugee card. That was a great opportunity for her to distill her work, thinking about war and refugee lives and, and the kind of theory around that, to distill that into a very different kind of form now in a tarot card and distill it in a way that allows now users or practitioners of the card to reflect on their own relationship to the forces that she looks at in her academic work. One of the most exciting things about this issue, I mean, aside from the multimedia-ness of it, is is your willingness to tackle a topic that academia, frankly, sucks at, which is mental health. And I mean, it's it's a conversation that has been happening amongst academics for a long, long time, but there doesn't seem to be much institutional institutionalization of it or res- institutional response to it. And we can think of why that is and how the very concept of mental health is just kind of structurally doesn't make any sense in the in the logic of produce, 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 particularly in, in today's yeah. academia. Do you have any suggestions or maybe did you find any strategies um, in the process of coming up with this journal or your work more broadly of how academia can do that better, how it can better tend to the mental health of, of its workers? I think you actually hit it right you know, on the head in terms of our culture of productivity. In academia, um, I would say that the word mental health does have does carry some weight, but it, it's pretty light and it's not really examined in the ways that you're you're asking. Um, and I think one of the main obstacles is because there is a deep, deep ableism that undergirds our obsession with productivity. Definitely. And but also with an obsession with this idea of mental strength in terms of willpower, like sheer willpower, uh, but also in terms of our intellectual abilities. We think for a living, we produce knowledge for a living, and so we're very invested in our mental capacities. And so acknowledging mental unwellness is quite scary and quite threatening. And so for me, doing better requires that we let go of this idea that mental wellness is normal, because actually we're all differentially unwell. We're always managing, always navigating different kinds of violent forces in our lives. Some of us have more capacity than others. Some of us have more proximity to the normal than others. Some of us have more access to support. Some of us have more or less distance from structures of violence in our daily lives. And so acknowledging that and thinking of ourselves as all differentially unwell and navigating would allow for us to actually have conversations and think about structural changes to support the mental health of of people in academia. In my capacity as editor-in-chief of the journal, I'm going to say, buy the issue. (laughs) (laughs) We will definitely Um, include links in in the show notes. uh, I mean, I think, I I mean, I want to add on to what Mimi said. I mean, I think we're creating this issue with the idea of trying to create space. The teaching program that we have attached to it is uh, one answer that, I mean, I think for approaching mental health in academia, one way is to make it part of your regular practice, not only in kind of daily self-care or in communal self-care, but in teaching, making a commitment to turn your classroom into space for thinking and feeling your way through this this issue. Um, some of it being led by students, as, as Mimi mentioned in Origin for this was her teaching um, over the past few years and sort of student demand. And one of the things we're seeing, particularly in communities of color, is student readiness. Um, There's a lot of talk about stigma attached to mental health, and that being why we're not getting at it, because there's traditionally stigma attached to it in Asian American or other communities of color. And I I think that's largely, it's true and not true, or it's a a, a self-perpetuating myth sometimes, and that our students are more ready than ever, we're finding. Students across the country are reaching out and telling us they're more ready than ever to talk about mental health and want spaces to do that and not even necessarily guidance they want they don't want guidance or license they just want us to be part of the conversation so having a teaching program listening to students we're trying to work with students to to have an event slate across the country to think about um, creating their own pop-up wellness spaces and i think for academia serving as a resource being part of this tapping into that energy is a way for us to serve our communities and serve our students, but also serve ourselves, that this is an important strategic opportunity for us because our universities as institutions have to listen to their students to some degree. Uh, and they don't have to listen to us, but they have to listen to the students. Yes, yeah, faculty and staff demanding concessions in terms of mental health or programming around mental health doesn't get us very far, but students clamoring for mental health does. And I think working with students is, a, is an opportunity, an important kind of juncture for, for, for us as well. It seems like a great example of what, Mimi, you've called in some of your other work, a pedagogy of vulnerability. 
and of thinking about vulnerability not as a detriment or something to fear or something to hide or something to banish in order to get in front of a class and and teach students, but rather vulnerability itself as pedagogy, as politics. I'm curious how this plays out in the different employment tiers in academia. So what a pedagogy of vulnerability means in the context of adjunct labor, in the context of contingent faculty labor, which is got to be very different than embracing a pedagogy of vulnerability as a tenure stream, pretty secure faculty member. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking of vulnerability, both in terms of personal vulnerability, but then structural vulnerability as well. So contingent faculty are in such a structurally vulnerable position in the university, especially women of color, especially queer folks of color. And if this project Uh, is trying to connect mental health to systems and structures, then how can we not talk about the real mental health consequences for those exploited by the university, right, and and made vulnerable by the university. And so, yes, choosing to be vulnerable looks very different for those who are already so structurally vulnerable in the university. Um, It's most risky for contingent faculty to reveal things about themselves. But for me, it feels important to model that kind of vulnerability in order to make visible the structural vulnerability and to ultimately to ask students to care about those things. So I see my role, you know, as a teacher, as not only teaching students to think critically and see critically um, the culture around them, but to care about injustice, to care about things that are happening. And for many of them, the instructors in front of them actually are adjuncts and contingent labor, and they don't know that, and they don't understand the um, actual dynamics of the university that they participate in. And so, you know, I tell my students I'm an adjunct. I tell them various things about myself and the ways that I am located as structurally vulnerable so that they can better see and understand and hopefully care about the issues and then ultimately care about each other. And so it's also a kind of pedagogy of care, of trying to cultivate care, um, which is part of how I think about doing mental health work. Lawrence, it seems like there's a lot of crossover with the work you do at the Asian American Literary Review Journal with regards to vulnerability or opening up space for authors, for poets, for artists, for scholars to think through some of the issues central to Asian American literary culture, Asian American life more broadly, as you put it. Do you see that kind of vulnerability play out in the work that you do with the journal? Yeah, I mean, I think a starting a starting point to answer that question, and, and, and let me know if I'm getting at what, what you're asking. What, when you say vulnerability, and I think about the journal, I think about its starting point as a project by a couple of grad students and working within the university and then branching out to become a nonprofit. The journal has always had a sort of cultivated vulnerability in the sense that we haven't accepted money from any major institutions that we've wanted to be on our own and to be independently funded, no money with strings attached so that we are able to make any critique that we feel like is in service of our communities and to be answerable primarily to our communities, to our readerships and to the the artists and contributors we work with. You know, traditionally for some people, any kind of journal that devotes itself to a body of literature or thinks of itself as a showcase, we are presenting work by writers of Asian descent is a kind of standard template. And we wanted to get away from that. We wanted to be intentional about not being a showcase, but about being an engine and pushing writers, not to just say, give us your work and we want to publish it, but to be in communication and to ask our writers to be in communication with our communities about what are the issues facing us now? What does social justice look like now? What does racial justice look like now? And kind of create these conduit of conversation that are threaded through and through with questions of vulnerability. How are our communities vulnerable? How are our artists vulnerable? Um, what should we be t- talking and writing about right now? Mimi, you opened our our conversation today talking about motherhood as as your kind of way into your interest in mental health and and this this fantastic special issue that came out of that. And I, I'd love to return to that just briefly, particularly because you've written some really smart stuff about this in in other in other contexts about the kind of intersections of motherhood and adjunct labor and how racialized trauma in particular shapes parenting and some often surprising, complex, messy ways. And I'd love to hear your thoughts about kind of how universities and post-ac or alt-ac institutions and companies can better support parents of color and address the kind of structural vulnerabilities that they face, but also encourage the kind of critical vulnerabilities that, that both of you have been talking about today. For the issue, our uh, main way of approaching issues of motherhood is through our um, PPD pamphlet that Lawrence mentioned a little earlier. 
uh, where we took a traditional pam- info pamphlet, like those brochures you get um, at the doctor's office that doctors or nurses hand you and then you throw away <laughs> uh, after you give birth. We took one of those and looked at it and tried to understand what it was trying to do and, and what are the gaps and where, where, you know, how, how is this actually not helpful? Why do women just throw it away? Why doesn't it actually help women who are struggling after they have um, children? So I worked with several other mothers, Asian American mothers who have gone through um, postpartum mood disorders to think about what are our needs? What did it look, what, you know, what did PPD look like for us? Um, where does it come from? What factors contribute to it? And to kind of re-theorize it. And what we came up with is that PPD is not simply a hormonal condition after birth, but actually a result of the neglect of mothers and the structural violence that mothers face. Um, our society is not supportive of mothers and hold up mothers as, you know, necessarily martyrs or super mothers who have to do everything. This can be particularly acute for mothers in academia because of the intense pressures to produce, to uh, produce work, to not produce biologically, to not have children, um, to wait to have children, say, after 10 years or something like that, um, and to function in departments as if you are child-free, as if you are free of any kind of caring responsibilities, um, because somehow that is the ideal academic worker. And so for me, how to change this, how to, how to do better. Support looks like you know, that truism, right? It, t- it takes a village. And so this means thinking about all of us people as having different kinds of caring responsibilities and to normalize those caring responsibilities and to then work those caring responsibilities into structures. So providing, you know, child care, providing um, flexible schedules, and also thinking about our workplaces as family spaces. So for instance, at the University of Maryland in my department in the Asian American Studies program. I take my daughter to meeting. Uh, often meetings are, try- we try to schedule meetings at times that are, you know, friendly and, and work for caring, different kinds of caring responsibilities. My other colleagues also bring their children sometimes. We have play dates between the children. Um, Lawrence actually once organized a summer bug camp for many of the children in the program. And so thinking about all of us as caregivers in different ways and creating a culture around that and then creating actual policies and structures to support those kinds of caring responsibilities. So this brings me to my favorite question that I get to ask guests. As you know, this podcast is called Imagine Otherwise, and the kind of impetus behind it is basically me getting to talk to really amazing people (laughs) who who do this with, with the work that they put out into the universe. They're imagining different worlds. So I'll ask both of you, what's that world or worlds perhaps that you're working towards when you, you know, edit your journal, when you get in front of a classroom, when you interact with your kids, when you, when you organize with, with colleagues and comrades, what world do you want? What world are you working towards? When we're doing those things, to some degree, that is the world. The uh, this idea of imagine otherwise, you know, think of, of Candace Chu's formulation and the notion that Asian America isn't a discrete term or a set of communities or a descriptor, so much as a, a process of you know communities continually imagining themselves into being, or a, and, you know a kind of continually evolving critique. And so I'm thinking about process for the for this issue, for instance, for open an emergency. Our focus throughout having to be not so much on the final thing that gets done, even as we're mired in like printing details and print runs and the cost of this and that and nuts and bolts and logistics of getting it done, but also in the you know the long lead up and then what we're hoping comes afterwards, the convening folks to talk about their buy-in to it and what they want to see out of it and what they want to do working with the, the many curators and contributors on the issue, not so much to just secure you're going to turn in this by this date or this is what your work is going to look like, but talking with one another, sometimes not about the work at all and creating um, communities of care and trust with each other has been so important that we, you, we've we realized at points that like that's been baked into this development is nurturing and, and listening more so than what might be traditionally understood as editing. And that process is just as important. This this thing over these last few years is just as important as the final kind of book art project that comes out in the world or even the hopefully, you know, the event slate and the opportunities for dialogue all across the country or in classrooms, that all of this process is important and that the the end product of the book isn't the isn't just the world that we want, that what we've created in the process as we're going is the world. That this is the world we want where we are caring and we're asking us to be accountable to each other and responsible 
to one another. I started the project in part because I was struggling with motherhood and dealing with my own mental health issues, but also as a project and gift for my daughter. So I actually opened the issue with a letter to my daughter in terms of what I want her to get out of the project, what I want her to, to see in it, and what I want her to be able to be um, as she lives her life and grow up. And it sort of boils down to, you know, I want a world in which she is free to be well and to be unwell as she navigates the world. And so that means figuring out what those things look like and giving her the tools to do that. I can't fix the world, but I can imagine a world in which we ha we can develop together and use tools in order to craft and cultivate, like Lawrence is saying, communities of care, spaces of care, and relationships with each other that are founded on care and accountability and love. And so this project for me is trying to gift the beginnings of that for my daughter. Sounds like a pretty awesome world. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think that's a great place to wrap up. Thank you both so much for being here. Yay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Imagine Otherwise. Check out our website at ideasonfire.net to listen to full episodes, read show notes, and see links to the people, books, and projects discussed on the show. While you're there, be sure to sign up for our newsletter to find out when new episodes are released and to get tips to help you rock your interdisciplinary career.